Good morning. Welcome to the uh, Cruise Seminar for Spring 2012, the first of which will be presented by our speaker today, Dr. Anand Radhakrishnan from Mastic. Uh, we have a pretty interesting lineup for this semester. We have Professor Mark Ballas from the University of Wyoming on the 10th of February, same room, around 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Professor Ray Chow from the University of Nebraska on March 9th, and Dr. Dianusia Taliprantis from Iowa State on April 13th. Now, uh, for those of you that don't know about CRU, CRU is a state collaboratory of three uh, institutions, Colorado State University, CU Boulder, and School of Mines, as well as National Renewable Energy Labs, NOAA, and NCAR. Uh, we run this seminar series once a semester, and we do both physical, uh, or we, we address both physical audiences <coughs> as well as those that are joining us through the internet. Uh, for those that are on the webcast, I apologize for not having a mechanism for hearing your feedback. We are working on it, and uh, let me assure you that for the February seminar and onwards, we will have a mechanism for accessing your questions and providing answers. Now, to get, uh, if you do have questions after today's seminar, feel free to email me at sid at colostate.edu, and I'll do my best to forward the questions to our speaker today and get you answers. So, so thank you email me. Absolutely. And uh, to those that did not hear, that was Dan Zimmerly, our scientific director, saying that he could also be a conduit for providing the contact with our speaker. Now, to our speaker for the day, it's Dr. Anand Radhakrishnan from Mastec. Uh, Anand has been conducting research on atmospheric wind lidars for the last five years and serves as the PI for uh, several NASA and Navy SBIR projects. He has a PhD in aerospace engineering from Alfred Gesell Rotorcraft Center at the University of Maryland, where he also worked briefly at the Glen L. Martin wind tunnel, uh, wind tunnel, I guess. Uh, he has been recognized by several awards and is a member of the American Helicopter Society, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and is also a full member of Sigma Psi. Now, before I let Anand take over, I would like to say a word of thanks to the School of uh, Global Environmental Sustainability, or SOGES, at CSU for generously co-sponsoring this series. So, without further ado, I'll let Anand take over. Thanks, Sid. First of all, um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Suri Narayanan and uh, the rest of the crew team for inviting me here. Very excited for this opportunity uh, to present our research that I feel is very relevant to the wind energy industry uh, at large. And uh, um, as, as Sid mentioned, I'm the PI for the Wind LiDAR program at uh, Mastec, located in Columbia, Maryland. And uh, the title of my talk today is LiDAR Remote Sensing of Atmospheric Winds Using Aerosol Backscatter Correlation. Let me start off with a brief overview of my seminar today. Uh, I'd like to start off with a small overview of MassTech, uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about the background of wind measurement technology, and then uh, go on to discuss the technical approach that we're using for our wind LiDAR, and uh, some of the design considerations that go into this problem. Um, then I'm going to introduce some wind measurements that we've made, as well as some validation studies, and then uh, talk about the applications of this technology to the wind energy industry, and then conclude with a summary. First, for the company overview, uh, Mastec is a small business uh, founded in 2005. It's located in Columbia, Maryland, and our website is shown here. Uh, we have about 10 employees, and uh, as you can see, our revenues have been steadily growing over the years. Uh, and uh, our two primary sources of revenue for Mastec come from government contracts, primarily in the form of SBIR contracts, as well as commercial sales of our mass spectrometry products. So Mastec was actually founded to commercialize the mass spectrometry technology develop developed by our sister company, Science and Engineering Services Incorporated. It's also located in Columbia, Maryland. And uh, they have a couple of successful products that have now reached the third generation. But, uh, over the last couple of years, we've been um, focusing on LiDAR technology as well, and uh, a lot of it has been transferred over from our sister company, 
along with me, I actually joined Mastec in 2010, prior to which I was an employee of SESI. And uh, we have several years, several, you know, uh, a couple of decades of experience in developing compact LIDARs for a range of different applications for a number of customers, especially in the uh, public space. We also have a, an expert from who uh, developed the NASA Harley scanning LIDAR system for uh, d measuring winds, which uh, I'll bring in later. Um, going on to talk about the background for wind measurement, first of all, why do we want to measure wind? The wind, has, uh, wind measurement has a number of applications in a number of industries. Uh, primarily one of which is uh, meteorology where uh, wind measurement is very useful for weather monitoring as well as weather forecasting and uh, an accurate measurement of wind would be very useful for that. It's also very useful in the aerospace and the aviation community, uh, one of which is in avionics such as uh, airspeed sensing. Um, you have uh, uh, also uh, other applications, such, you know, one of which we are actually uh, primarily focused on in Mastec um, which is for airport mon wind monitoring. And uh, in an airport, you have uh, the reason to measure wind because you have a number of aircraft uh, landing and taking off uh, very closely spaced to each other. And you also have wake vortices that are generated by the aircraft that if you can detect, you can significantly cut down the takeoff and the landing time between aircraft. In addition, if you are a, a operator of an airline or another fleet of aircraft such as a cargo aircraft and uh, shipping, then uh, you would like to know what the, the wind speed is in the geographical area that you serve, and it could s help a lot in your operations and your planning of your, of your fleet. Um, another application in the aerospace industry is in uh, ground and flight testing of aircraft and related technologies, including wind tunnels and um, other uh, hover test stands and other things that you could think of as well as validation of computational approaches that are designed to predict the wind speed. And coming to the wind energy industry, it has a lar lar large number of applications in the wind energy industry. I'm not going to go into it in detail in this slide. I'm going to come back to it later in the presentation and talk about how um, this could be useful in the wind energy space. And other uses of wind measurement include defense, as well as uh, uh, applications such as um, measuring of uh, the air, air, air flow around buildings, which can cause air loads on the building. So uh, wind measurement, the next moving on to how you measure the wind. Wind can be measured either by using point sensors, where you measure, point, me measure the wind at a single point, or standoff sensing, where you actually measure the wind from far away or at least stand off from where the point where you're trying to measure it. So there are a range of different types of point sensors available. Some of them, they include mechanical probes, which include moving components such as pitot probes, propeller anemometers, or cup and vein anemometers, and also non-mechanical sensors such as ultrasonic anemometers and hot wire probes. And uh, the advantages of using of many of these uh, uh, point sensors is that they can provide high time and space resolution depending on where you put it. And uh, they can also be rather accurate and they're mature technologies that are commercially available and are extensively deployed. The disadvantages are that they're intrusive in that if you put a point sensor in the wind, flow, wind field that you're trying to measure, you actually interfere with the flow and you're changing the reading that you're trying to get. Um, and also they can only provide in situ measurements. So you can, if you're trying to measure wind that's like uh, 100 meters off the ground, it's very difficult to put a point sensor up there unless you're putting it in a weather balloon or similar such mechanism. And uh, it's also, these sensors are also rather expensive when you're trying to perform large scale monitoring of a, a large area because you're going to have to populate it with a range of different sensors and it's uh, very expensive uh, not only to install them but also to maintain them and collect the data from them. And also, the data quality from point sensors is highly dependent on where you put it. For example, if you're trying to measure the wind uh, in an airport, if you put it behind a tree, you're going to not going to get a very good reading of the, of the wind, flow, wind field. Now, moving on to standoff sensing. Um, there are many different ways of, uh, of uh, standoff sensing of wind speed. Uh, first, let me focus on some of the la laboratory techniques that are out there. These include light sheet techniques where you project a light sheet in a seeded flow field and then you use, uh, and you use a camera to image them, such as particle imaging velocimetry or Doppler global velocimetry. 
You also have uh, techniques where you have intersecting beams, um, such as laser Doppler anemometry. The common thing to all these laboratory approaches is that they require a controlled low light environment in order to perform these studies because they use lasers and you have detectors that can be uh, affected by the ambient lighting. And also you need, a, you need to seed the flow in order to actually seed, when I say seed the flow, you mean like introduce some smoke or other tracers in order to actually uh, um, uh, calculate the wind. And another, another issue with this is that these are double-ended techniques in that you have a light source that's at a different location than your, than your sensor. So then you, so therefore it's not, uh, you can't just use a, put a sensor here and then measure the wind over there. And they also tend to be rather s small scale, so these are not directly applicable to use in general atmospheric wind measurements. Um, there are other techniques that you can use, such as scintillometry, where you either have a single light source and two detectors, or a single uh, detector and two light sources, and you calculate the wind speed along the line of sight of this instrument by measuring the atmospheric scintillations and correlating the atmospheric scintillations between the two beams. And uh, the problem with this is that you only get an average velocity between the, uh, the detector and the, and the light source, and therefore there's no range resolution, so you can only get a single measurement. And also you can only measure the crosswind component along this beam. You can't get the range uh, component. Along, along the, you can't get the line of sight component of the wind. And there's also several Doppler techniques that you can use, such as Doppler radar or SODAR, which is an acoustic technique, or RAS, which is a combination of radar and acoustic. And uh, they, are, uh, they have uh, been deployed in meteorology applications. And uh, um, you know, coming to LIDAR, which is kind of the focus of my talk today, uh, uh, let me start off by introducing what a LIDAR is. A LIDAR is an instrument where you have a transmitter um, that uh, sends out a, a light pulse, typically a laser, and then you measure the backscatter from the atmosphere, and then you measure it with a detector that's located either coincident in the same, in the same telescope as the transmitter or, in a, in, or very close to it. And uh, we have over overlapping fields of view. And then Doppler LIDAR essentially measures the wind speed um, by calculating the Doppler shift of the return signal that you send out. And uh, you measure this, you can only measure a single component along the line of sight of the beam that you send out. And also the, the spatial resolution that you get from a Doppler LIDAR is rather sparse. You cannot get uh, smaller than typically 100 or maybe as close as 50 meters is the best you can do. If you want to get finer than that, you're going to have to use other techniques. And uh, another issue with Doppler LIDARs is that you need some specialized equipment in order to calculate the frequency shift which makes it uh, rather complex and potentially expensive. So moving on to the technical approach that we are using to calculate the wind speed, it's, uh, it's also a LIDAR technique. So instead of using a single beam that's pointed along the direction you want it, you actually uh, place three parallel LIDAR beams. And then you measure the elas elastic backscatter, uh, primarily through me scattering. Uh, of the return of, of from aerosol particles in the atmosphere, aerosol structures in the atmosphere. And using this technique, you can actually measure three components of the, beam, of the, of the wind by correlating the motion of uh, aerosol tracers from one beam to another and along, along each beam. So um, this potentially offers higher spatial and temporal resolution than other techniques and also provides a simpler design because you just have pure elastic backscatter, which is a very, it's a very well-established approach that has been perfected over the last uh, 50 years or so. And uh, the, uh, um, it, you can actually think of this technique as if you were to shine, a, uh, if, you, if you see a, uh, a beam of light coming in through the window, you can typically see air, you know, dust particles and other particles moving through this beam. And by, uh, by tracing the motion of the particles that pass through that beam, you can actually calculate what the wind velocity is in that space. So uh, this shows like a prototype of our an early breadboard of our instrument, and you can see the three parallel LIDAR beams. Um, and then you can see if you, if you have an aerosol structure that passes through it, you can calculate the line of sight component in each beam by, the mo by, by tracking the particles moving along the line of sight of the beam. And you can calculate the crosswind between any two beams by, by correlating the time it takes 
to go from one beam to the other. So I'm going to uh, have some technical issues with playing this video like this. I'm going to actually play it from outside. So this is actually uh, a video that's obtained from uh, University of Wisconsin, who actually pioneered the, pioneered the measurement of winds from aerosol backscatter correlation, primarily uh, by May, especially Mayer and Eloranta. Um, and uh, this is a rather dramatic video that shows the motion of a weather front through uh, the field, through the scan, through the scanned view of a lidar that's scanning over the Great Lakes. And uh, you can see that, uh, I'm going to start this from the beginning, so. You can see that this weather front, it's very clear, and from the motion of the, of the aerosols passing through the view, you can actually easily calculate a 2D wind field from this. That was, I think, the whole um, thing took, took place over uh, about um, two minutes, I believe. Actually, sorry, uh, I think it's two hours, if I'm not mistaken. Anand? Yeah. For, for our listeners on the web, could you repeat the question the next time? Because I don't think we are wired for the Sure, OK. Um, I think Dan's question was, what are the time resolution of that video? So going back to the presentation, so instead of scanning through this entire 2D flow field, what if you just put a fixed line of sight beam, uh, or a line of sight instrument, with two parallel lines of sight, like through two parallel beams, then you can actually um, uh, calculate, the, if, if look at the time series of the LIDAR signal at each range bin. And that can be shown here. Like, let's say you take two separate range bins, and you can see an aerosol structure passing through one, and an aerosol structure passing here, and you can actually calculate the time shift from going from one beam to an, one range bin to another. And if you look at uh, bins from each beam, then you can actually calculate the crosswind because you know the distance between the beams at each location based on the angle between the beams. And uh, you can also calculate the line of sight component because you know how long it takes to go from one range bin to another along the line of sight. So if you were to present the data that you get from each beam as a function of range and as a function of time on the x-axis, then uh, this is what it looks like. And you have two different beams, so you have two different images that you get. And before you start calculating the wind speed, you want to first break it up into smaller kernels where, so that you can compare the two uh, kernels with each other to calculate your two components of the wind. Um, and uh, you can see, actually, there's a fair amount of uh, backscatter signal in the data that I'm showing right now. It's actually a rainy day. So. And uh, in order to calculate the line of sight wind, if you look inside a single, single kernel, you can see that a, a feature is actually moving through this. And uh, you can actually calculate the line of sight wind from the slope of the features that are moving through it. So if you look at this, it's actually a signal, um, an aerosol structure that's actually starting at around the 20 meter mark, and it's moving closer to you. That means the wind is actually towards you. And from the time it takes to move from here to here, you can actually calculate the wind speed. So the line of sight wind can be expressed simply as based on the resolution of your image. So basically the range resolution divided by the time resolution times the tangent of the angle of the, of the feature. And similarly for calculating the crosswind, if, it, if you see a feature that's moving on from one image to the other, like you, know, you can see the time delay of the, of the time it takes to go from one beam to the other. And then use the time delay. Uh, you divide the distance between the beams by the time delay to calculate the cross, crosswind component. And since you have three different beams, you can actually calculate all three components from the line of sight and then the two other components. So moving on to some of the design considerations that you would have in uh, designing such an instrument. Um, first, you want to do a requirements analysis. First, you want to analyze what application you're designing this instrument for. And you want to quantify uh, things such as the wind speed range, the number of wind components you want to calculate, whether it's a single component you're interested in, or two components, or three components. And then you figure out what accuracy you want to design this for, as well as the temporal and spatial resolution of the wind, winds you're measuring from this instrument. And you also want to measure what is the minimum standoff distance that's acceptable uh, from your instrument 
to where you start measuring and the maximum distance that you want to measure too. And also you have to factor in instrument requirements such as whether it's required to be eye safe, you know, especially airports present a very uh, stringent requirement for that and that you're not allowed to use any visible lasers at all in the vicinity of an airport. And uh, things such as the size and the weight of the instrument, which is even more important when you're dealing with airborne instruments. And uh, what kind of user interface you want the instrument to have. Uh, environmental requirements, such as whether you want to operate it from indoors or you want to put it out in the field and let it run in rain, snow, sun, shine, sun and, you know, day, and then whether it's daytime or nighttime. And also what kind of temperature range do you want the instrument to have. Uh, also, whether you want the instrument to have a scanning capability, instead of just looking along a line, do you want it to be able to move to other locations and actually uh, sense the wind there? And also, the number of fields of view you want the instrument to have. From these uh, requirements, uh, these requirements actually flow through this, to the system design considerations, such as uh, whether, what kind of signal to noise ratio you want to have the signal the system to have what kind of uh, range kernel, range wind size you want to have, what kind of temporal resolution you want to have, and what kind of spacing between the beams that you want to have. Suppose you have a high wind, you want to actually increase the beam spacing because otherwise you're not going to be able to see the wind moving from one beam to another. And uh, from these you, uh, flow through to the actual subsystem design variables such as what wavelength laser you want to use, what kind of power you want the laser to have, uh, what kind of pulse width do you want the laser to have, um, and then uh, the detector parameters, whether you want to use analog detectors, photon counting detectors, or, and then what kind of uh, telescope aperture that you want to have, and that kind of is dependent on a number of these factors, actually, including the size and the weight requirements, as well as the signal-to-noise ratio you want to have, and as well as what kind of data system that you want to use. So, um, I'm going to uh, discuss if you're, I don't want to scare anybody with this equation, but it just uh, shows the, if the number of photons that um, the LIDAR will measure in, in the return signal. This includes signal from the aerosol backscatter, but it also includes signals from the molecular scattering that from the uh, uh, molecules in the atmosphere, as well as background light coming from, depending on what kind of wavelength you're using and what kind of filter size you have, as well as dark, dark counts coming from the detector itself. So our signal term for this is actually just the aerosol backscatter. And uh, actually, it's actually the fluctuation in the aerosol backscatter, which you can actually fuse, take you back quickly to this figure. You can actually see that, you know, it's not just, if you have a constant aerosol field, you're not going to get any measurements at all. You're going to need fluctuations in this aerosol field. And then um, this depends on many factors, such as the transmitted laser power, uh, what kind of transceiver you're using, what area, what efficiency, and what kind of overlap between the transmit and the receive channels, um, and what kind of detector you're using in terms of efficiency and the bandwidth, um, what kind of time and space resolution you're using, and the distance, because the aerosol return signal goes, falls as the square root of the distance from the instrument. So if you want to look really far away, you're going to have to either maximize the, air, the telescope area or increase the efficiency. And uh, also atmospheric conditions, which uh, control the backscatter coefficient, uh, as well as the atmospheric extinction. And the noise terms, as I mentioned, are, comes primarily from the short noise, so the total um, uh, number of photons measured, and this comes from the molecular backscatter, the background radiation, and the detector dark noise. So the signal to noise ratio can just be expressed as the number of aerosol signals divided by the square root of the total signals you're measuring. And uh, the short noise increases as the signal increases, but your signal, the signal to noise ratio also increases faster. So the molecular backscatter is rather wavelength dependent, and it's actually lower when you're using ultraviolet wavelength, for example. It's actually higher when you use ultraviolet wavelength, and it kind of drops off as you go towards the infra infrared range of the spectrum. And uh, the background radiation depends on things such as the telescope aperture, how narrow of a field of view that you're using, as well as what kind of band filter that you're using to kind of cut down the background radiation. And uh, the detector dark noise is dependent uh, on the kind of detection technology you're using. 
analog detectors tend to have rather high dark noise. So uh, we found that uh, using photon counting detectors can greatly increase the signal to noise ratio of a signal of a, of a system. And that is the approach that we're using in our instrument. So in order to make your wavelength selection, you have to factor in a number of uh, factors, including the eye safety of your eye safety limits that are allowed by uh, many different regulations, including the FAA regulations as well as the ANSI uh, regulations for eye safety. And I've put up, put up some sample numbers of what the eye safe power limit is for a six inch telescope at four different regions that we're considering. One is the UV uh, and green lasers that's visible as well as uh, near IR, which is close to one micron, and then uh, IR is 1.5, mid IR is 1.5 microns. And you can see that uh, UV and green have, uh, especially green, uh, visible lasers have very low tolerance for the amount of power you can put out. But they also have a rather high detector efficiency, especially for photon counting detectors. And uh, UV also has a, a pretty good um, detector efficiency compared to IR. But uh, these are not very suitable, especially visible lasers are not very suitable for outdoor use just because they're severely frowned upon by the FAA and you can actually go to jail for pointing a, a visible laser at an airplane. So <laughs> you want to be uh, very careful of using visible lasers. And UV also has some issues, as I mentioned, because of molecular scattering is rather high, which is reduces the signal to noise ratio. So we, we want to consider like IR wavelengths primarily so um, you can see that the allowed um, average power limit for, um, let me go into this slide actually, the 1.5 micron wavelength and higher allows you to have a laser power that's more than 10 times higher than one micron. Uh, but the problem is that th there is no mature photon counting detection technology available as of today. Although the technology is progressing, which hopefully it will be mature in a few years. So that's where we ultimately want to go. That is the wavelength we ultimately want to go to. Um, unless we want to use analog detectors, but the, that has its own set of problems, such as the need for really high power and high maintenance uh, lasers that uh, also tend to be rather bulky. So we want to, we, we're having a design path to go to 1.5 micron technology eventually. So for now, we're, we have a lot of experience building one micron systems, and uh, we have picked the 1030 nanometer wavelength because of the fact that the quantum efficiency of photon counting detectors available right now is, uh, is quite large compared to uh, more commonly used uh, 1064 and 1047 nanometer wavelength lasers that are available and used more commonly. So we've actually developed a 1030 nanometer ytterbium YAG Q-switch laser that actually produces very short pulses, which enables us to have a very narrow range resolution and uh, this, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, the, the ISAFE power limit at uh, 1030 is still pretty low compared to where we want to be. So we're actually going to be exceeding that power limit, but we're going to make it operationally ISAFE by having an intrusion detection circuitry in our instrument. So if you actually see some object enter the field of view of this instrument, it immediately shut itself down to a, a, a more ISAFE power output or shut itself off completely. So uh, that's how we're planning to tackle the eye safety issue for now. Um, so this shows the design specifications of um, our, the prototype that we're building right now. Uh, the typical specs of which are, you know, the wind speed range that we're designing for is uh, zero to 50 meters per second, which should cover most naturally occurring air, you know, air speeds in the atmosphere. Um, the wind component error, we're trying, we're trying to keep it below one meter per second. And uh, that, uh, again, it depends on the wind, wind uh, beam spacing that you're using as well as the uh, time and space resolution that you have. And we try to, since LIDARs have, uh, typically have a blind spot in the immediate uh, uh, vicinity of the instrument, we start measuring about 150 meters away from the instrument. We can go out to as far as three kilometers. Uh, right now, and it can easily be extended out to greater than 7.5 kilometers, which we've actually done with our other LIDAR instruments in the past. And the range resolution that we're using for this uh, is around one, we're obtaining aerosol backscatter around one meter, 
And using that, we're calculating winds with 10 meter wind, wind resolution, and spatial resolution. And uh, we're getting uh, aerosol backscatter data at 0.1 second time resolution. And using that to calculate uh, an update rate of, uh, we're, de we're designing for over 10 seconds, but we, we have shown the ability to get it at one second in the past. And uh, we, we made, as I mentioned, we made this operationally uh, class one laser technology. So um, we're, we're still working on getting it to the 1.5 micron so we don't have to worry about eye safety uh, since after that. So next, I want to talk about some of the wind measurements we've obtained using our instrument. Um, so this shows uh, the earlier image that I used to illustrate the kernel division. And uh, this LIDAR resolution is one meter by uh, 0.1 seconds, which means updates at 10 hertz. Um, and the time is on the x-axis and the range is on the y-axis. And this is like one, this is a left beam, and th sorry, this, and this is a right beam. And uh, you can see this is about a two minute stretch of data. And uh, we're comparing the, and we had an, this actually, we actually located LIDAR inside our building and we're looking outside into this rainstorm that was actually passing through, fortunately at that time. And we had an ultrasonic anemometer sitting right on top of our uh, LIDAR and for comparison purposes. Uh, I, mean, I just take this opportunity to mention that there are some serious issues comparing the wind measurements from a standoff instrument that actually averages your wind speed over a range, comparing it to a point instrument, which is going to have much higher uh, fluctuations because of the fact that it's a single point. And uh, that's, it's been a persistent issue with the validation of uh, LIDAR and other um, remote sensing instruments. And uh, the only best way to compare it is with another remote sensing instrument, such that if you're able to get a Doppler LIDAR that's parallel to our, right next to our instrument and has either an intersecting field of view or a very closely spaced field of view, that would be the best way to validate it and we're moving in that direction. We hope to have some validation tests like that. So for now, we'd have to make do with these kind of comparison studies. So this shows the uh, line of sight wind component um, of the LIDAR, which is shown in blue, and uh, the anemometer, ultrasonic anemometer, which is shown in black with the dashed lines. Um, I don't know if you can see it from back there, but um, you can see that it, it doesn't match perfectly, but it, uh, it, it shows a generally the same response to the wind. And uh, the RMS difference between the two instruments is less than a meter per second. And the mean difference is also less than a meter per second over this two minute interval. And similarly, there's a crosswind that we measured using our instrument. That is the wind uh, across the two beams. And this is actually average for uh, the time resolution in the line of sight wind is 10 meters by one second, which means you use a uh, kernel that's 10 by 10. 10 in the spatial direction and 10 in the temporal direction. And uh, this is at, uh, this line of sight wind is calculated at 20 meter distant from the anemometer. And as you remember, the anemometer is sitting right on top of the instrument, like on top of the building. And uh, the crosswind is compared to the res was calculated with a resolution of 20 meters by 8 seconds, which is like a kernel of 20 by 80. And you can see that it actually matches quite well for a good portion of uh, the two minutes. And the RMS difference is also less than one meter per second, and the mean difference is also less than one meter per second. Was that an anemometer? It's, an it's a young uh, ultrasonic, ultrasonic an three-axis three anemometer. And uh, hmm? I have to mention that it's actually smoothed a little bit because you have a fair amount of, uh, you had filtered out some of the noise, so. Yeah, but it's also the building effect. Yeah, the, the other thing is, you know, when you're making any measurements, wind measurements close to the ground, unless you're perfectly coincident, you're not going to see the same wind field in the two points. So that's, yes, you, you, you're very right in that. I, so Dan, okay, and just for Sid's purposes, Dan's question was, uh, since the uh, uh, anemometer was uh, actually just above the building, there are building effects that would affect the aerodynamic comparison of the wind measurement at the two points. So uh, moving on, we also decided to do another uh, cross-check 
of the way we calculate a line of sight and crosswind, we actually took our LIDAR and pointed it at a 30 degree elevation angle and we pointed it in one, uh, one, one part of the sky and then we turned it 90 degrees. So the first time we would measure the line of sight and the crosswind and if you actually measured 90 degrees off, you're actually going to measure uh, it, the crosswind and the line of sight components are inverted. And uh, this is actually at a distance of 5.5 kilometers away from the LIDAR. So that's probably about two or three kilometers up in the sky. Well, actually, probably a little less than two kilometers in the sky. And uh, at, that, at that point, the wind velocities are rather, rather constant, both with time and uh, space. So it would be, provides a good way of giving you, uh, um, you know, a common sense validation of your instrument. So this shows the, uh, both the two beams that we use to calculate these uh, wind components. You can see some scattered clouds in the sky, and using that we calculated the crosswind and the line of sight wind. And the crosswind here was ranging from about uh, negative two or three meters per second to about one meter per second. And the, cross and the line of sight wind was ranging from, you know, greater than about two meters per second up to five meters per second. And uh, we flipped it around 90 degrees, and we actually noticed that the line of crosswind that we calculated there agrees with the line of sight wind from before. And the line of sight wind from this thing agreed with the crosswind from before, which gives a good sanity check for calculating these things. And with a better validation campaign, we hopefully will have more results to present soon. We actually have a field test going on right now, hopefully which will yield us better measurements. So um, now going to the uh, wind energy applications of this technology. Um, there are a fair number of uh, applications and I've, uh, I was having a conversation earlier with some of the wind people here and they seem to indicate that it's even more promising than I thought. And um, so let me go over some of these applications for wind farms, both offshore and terrestrial. It always, it's good to have a remote sensing capability of three component winds at different heights and distances from the uh, wind turbines and the wind farm. And uh, this can be used, um, for example, for surveying of uh, prospective wind farms. If you want to put your instrument out there and then measure the wind and how it varies throughout the year over your geographic area, you're trying to put the wind, wind uh, um, farms. And also existing wind farms, you could maybe add a few turbines or change the spacing of the, of the turbines or um, other applications for, for surveying purposes using a wind, a wind field around the wind farm. Another application of measuring the wind speed at multiple heights is to obtain wind speed profiles, uh, which could give you uh, control input into the uh, wind turbine itself, uh, as well as provide you with atmospheric turbulence measurements, as well as wind shear profiles um, in the, you know, in the vertical, uh, vertical profiles as well as provide you with uh, wind gust warnings. So if suddenly a huge gust front is coming towards you, you can actually sense it before it hits your instrument, it hits your turbines. So you might be able to uh, provide some control inputs to minimize damage or, or such. And then, um, as I mentioned, you, know, you can also control uh, each individual wind turbine or you can um, control like the general wind farm using a wind uh, spatially and temporally resolved wind measurements that can be provided by such an instrument. In addition, if you're talking about a smart grid, um, either, either large scale or small scale, um, if you're able to monitor the wind um, passing through uh, the areas where you have wind farms, you might be able to control what kind of power plant utilization you have from other technologies, just from your, if you know a front is coming towards your wind farm and you can actually, your, wind, your, wind output, your power output is going to go up in your wind farm, then you can actually shut down your, um, your you know, coal-fired coal uh, power plant for a little bit and then bring it back up and the wind, feel, wind dries down. So the wind energy applications could be either low resolution wind measurements or high resolution wind measurements. The low resolution wind measurements is we could use it for uh, wind farm uh, monitoring ahead of the wind uh, the farm as well as surveying as well as I mentioned smart grid applications. High resolutions can be used for individual wind turbine control 
and de generating uh, wind shear profiles um, and, and gust warnings and turbulence measurements. We also have some other related technologies that we're developing at MassTech, which could be applicable um, to the wind energy and the atmospheric sensing industry at large. We have several, we are also designing LIDAR systems for standoff detection of other atmospheric state variables such as temperature, where we uh, just got funding to start uh, initial design of, of a, um, a temperature profiler using Raman scattering, um, using LIDAR. And uh, also we're thinking, of, we're, we're in the process of starting uh, measuring density using rally scattering. Um, there also, we also have a range of sensors for detecting atmospheric composition, primarily hydrocarbons. Uh, we have in situ te technology for detection of the, the very small concentrations of uh, different hydrocarbons, such as methane, using uh, photoacoustic sensing technology. And uh, we also are, are developing sand off uh, sensors using LIDAR using uh, laser induced fluorescence for detecting f formaldehyde com composition in the atmosphere. So in summary, um, the technical approach that we're using for our instrument is uh, based on elastic backscatter from aerosol structures, which is inherently simpler than using Doppler techniques and could potentially be either complementary, complementary to existing um, LIDAR approaches. Um, the modular design of our system enables rapid development of this instrument for a range of applications uh, because we can easily switch design variables such as time and space resolution, um, wavelength, uh, the telescope size, and other parameters. Uh, also, uh, we intend to have an operational three-dimensional wind LIDAR prototype in uh, early 2013 and we intend to launch a validation campaign to confirm the measurement capability of such a system. Um, and our initial LIDAR wind measurements have yielded promising comparisons with uh, ultrasonic anemometers and cup and vein anemometers. Um, also, um, uh, our, again, our, our instrument measures the three-dimensional wind components as opposed to uh, Doppler systems that only measure single line of sight wind unless you scan it where you're measuring winds at different points. You can still measure 3D, but it's at different points. Uh, it can operate in ambient day daylight conditions, unlike uh, laboratory instruments such as particle imaging velocimetry and others. Uh, and, it, and our instrument is capable of providing good, good wind coverage uh, whenever you have atmospheric boundary layer aerosols, um, which is pr more common in the coastal areas and not so common in deserts in the southern hemisphere, for example. Uh, we can provide uh, high spatial and temporal resolution compared to other uh, standoff sensors. And uh, we are building this primarily using com uh, commercially off-the-shelf components which could uh, reduce the design risk overall. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, a NASA SBIR Phase II contract um, from our Kotar, who is Dr. Narasimha Prasad at NASA Langley. And I'd also like to um, acknowledge Dr. Kool Prasad and Mr. Gary Schwimmer at Science and Engineering Services Incorporated, who is our sister company, for their contributions to this project. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> so I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I always have questions. Yeah. <laughs> or would you like to move forward so that you might be able to pick it up on the microphone? Or I can translate, I can uh, repeat every set question so that we <laughs> have a record of it. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat your questions. So. It is a pulse system. It is a pulse, uh, we use a pulse laser and we average several pulses in order to calculate, to generate each laser pro, uh, LIDAR profile. Okay. So, so if you were putting it in a scanning type of environment, what, at what rate would you scan in order to get kind of the line of sight resolution as you're tweaking the process? So the question is, uh, if you wanted to use it in a scanning cap capability, uh, what kind of uh, scanning 
Uh, you, what is the scanning rate, you're asking? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so how, how fast can you resolve the line of sight? Mm -hmm. So that as you move from you know, bearing A to bearing B, mm -hmm. you, you have a complete picture of that line of sight. So well, uh, if you go back, I showed you uh, a slide which showed what the uh, range and the time resolution of our instrument is. So let's say you're using a 10 meter by one second kernel, which is kind of uh, at the lower end of the spectrum. If you, you know, if you if you wanted a 10 meter, 10 second, let's say, you would probably scan, look at that direction for 10 seconds to calculate your three components of the wind, and then you could move to the next part and calculate three three uh, you know components again in the other bearing. And the other thing is, uh, we are also working on um, a new al I mean other algorithms which would enable us to continuously scan the instrument which would generate a continuous uh, wind uh, measurement as we scan it through. Obviously, your time and spatial resolutions are going to be determined by your scan rate. If you scan very fast, your resolution is going to be low. I mean, in space, but it will be faster in time. But if you scan slower, you're going to have higher spatial resolution, but smaller temporal resolution. So how do you reconcile the errors in these two resolutions? I, I ask this because I've had uh, do some Mm -hmm. actually look at time varying components mm -hmm. the magnitude of a certain harmonic let's say varies over time yeah. and if you don't use the proper uh, technique the, the artifact in the process completely messes up with the estimation so I was wondering if that is a problem in this because you're looking at both the spatial and the temporal information so the question was uh, if you had uh, you know uh, if you have uh, if we have issues with uh, resolving errors in time and space because of uh, artifacts that could be generated um, in the calculation in wind measurement calculation from the uh, backscatter there could be an answer is yes there could be and you have to be very careful in uh, tailoring your algorithm either it could should be dynamic or if you know uh, up front what kind of environment you're placing the instrument in let's say if it's maritime or let's say you're trying to measure the wind field from the downwash of a helicopter, for example, there are going to be very different kinds of turbulence scales. So you have time and, you know, time and spatial scales that could affect the size of the aerosol structures you're trying to track. So if you have larger aerosol structures passing through, you might want to have to increase your kernel size, which would basically reduce your time and space resolution. And therefore, uh, you have to account for that. And you, you know, this validated by using other instruments in the end. So, thank you. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> so basically, what we are doing is we are tracking the aerosol pattern in atmosphere or in space, mm -hmm. and we are just uh, uh, assuming comparison of two patterns, which which have would change and evolve with the speed and with the wind in space. Now, with the wind speed, how does how does the resolution and the accuracy so the question is, since we're tracking aerosol structures passing through from one beam to another or along, so along a beam where the pattern could be changing, how does that affect the, uh, the wind speed calculation in the error? Okay, well, if you think about it, um, your wind speed affects how fast it goes, the aerosol structure it's going to take to go from one beam to another. So let's say your kernel size that you've picked is certain value. And let's say the structure goes from one beam to the other. In short, in, in lo it takes longer than your kernel size to go from one to the other. You're not going to see it. Yeah. So you're going to have to, your, your kernel size and the beam spacing should be dependent on the wind velocity range that you're trying to measure. So I mean, so is, is there a dynamic uh, adjustment to this range? There's two approaches. One, we have an instrument, we have currently have designed an instrument that's capable of dynamically adjusting the angle to account for the prevailing wind speed. But we are also designing instruments that don't. But for that, we had to compensate by increasing the time resolution of your measurement so that you can actually keep the, wind, you can actually keep the beams closer together so you won't miss it going from one to the other. Not really, it's me scattering. Okay. The aerosol backscatter is me scattering. Oh, I'm sorry, the molecular scattering. Molecular scattering is rally, yeah. So is that a function of the atmospheric content of elements or the wind speed? Or how 
it's it depends on a number of things, including I mean, as is, as I went over, it, it's dependent on all the factors that I mentioned for the aerosol backscatter. Except instead of the aerosol backscatter, you're going to coefficient, you're going to use a molecular backscatter coefficient, which depends on the density and the size of the particles in the atmosphere. So the Rayleigh scattering is dependent. It's kind of a measure of density of the atmosphere too. So and also the wavelength. It's wavelength dependent. So. Well, um, if you're going to see a really high speed wind in your instrument, I mean, it's much more difficult in the crosswind, but in the line of sight wind, if your streak, you know, when I showed you the slope of the streak like this, instead of being so, the slope being so small, it's going to be like this, right? It's going to be much, much steeper slope. So you, you definitely can't go beyond a certain range, certain, um, slope because of your time resolution is kind of fixed. You can't really go, you, you can, but it's going to be very difficult for you to uh, go beyond the uh, data limits of your system. So it's, it's hard to uh, design a system that's going to see it unless you increase your kernel size. So let's say you have a kernel, instead of having 20 bins in the range direction, let's say you have 1,000 bins, you might be able to see that. So if you're expecting a tornado, then you can ask your sensor to dynamically adjust your kernel to have a much higher range resolution. So you can pick up the higher winds, but it comes at a cost of range and spatial resolutions. Range and, range and, temp and time resolution, so. You want to get closer? <laughs> How about now? I think I'm good. So, uh, thanks, Anas. Do you want to take this? Or? Uh, our next seminar will be presented by Professor Mark Dallas, who is the head of the department at, uh, of, of ECE at the University of Wyoming on Friday, February 10th at 10 a.m. at Ralph Hall. And we'll also be webcasting that seminar. Uh, Professor Ballas will be talking about the adaptive control of utility sized wind turbines in operating regions two and three. And uh, going by his abstract, it's, I, I think it's going to be a very interesting talk. So I invite you to join us on February 10th as well. So thank you.